Disruptors and curious minds, welcome to another episode of Thinking on Paper, where we get to talk to the innovators, the builders, the technologists that are exploring and designing the next version of the world. My name is Jeremy. I run a program called Right to Know You. I like to write. I like to explore. I like to read and connect the dots to see what the heck is going on in the world. With me, as always, is Mark Fielding, talented writer, lore developer, storyteller, expert in Web3, all the fun stuff, living in the French house. Mark, um, how are things today, man? You were doing some research on YouTube videos, uh, watching Mr. Beast. Tell me what you learned this week. <laughs> Um, I, I like that. You, uh, I'm happy that you like writing if you run a program called Write to Know You, because that would be, you know, a bit, a bit odd. If you did. We we'll kind of have to like writing. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, more interesting than Mr. Beast videos, I was researching about virtual reality and mental health. So I would check that out much more than Mr. Beast videos. But um, yeah, watch our YouTube and you'll see how my knowledge for Mr. Beast videos helps. The main thing I've been thinking about this week, though, Jeremy, is our book club. Obviously, um, for those who aren't aware, Thinking on Paper is not just a podcast, it's a book club. Um, we read books to help us think better about the technology that our guests present to us. First book was The Nexus. Look at that. Second book, The Design of Everyday Things. And this week, we're starting Clear Thinking by Shane Parrish of Farnham Street. So if you want to get clearer thinking and approach emerging tech and culture with more clarity come and join us every tuesday on youtube and what's more if you if you don't necessarily like to read uh you can just listen to the episodes and hear us talking about what we read um True. so there's a shortcut button for you uh you know human nature loves shortcuts we're providing one for you or read it with us and uh, maybe, have a maybe blast that should be our sales pitch like don't read books listen to us read them with that's i've got it i've got it that's a little dichotomy that i'm struggling with right now mark because yeah. i want people to read too but um yeah so definitely join the book club we got a great show uh planned for today yeah. uh we're again casting a vision into the future trying to figure out what to watch how to monitor it and how to sense make some of those threads uh before we get started want to thank our great friends at ripple w-r-i-p-p-l-e ripple is marketing's on-demand talent platform so as a as an organization, you may have these projects that spin up that you don't have the internal resources for. Maybe it's an interdisciplinary project that you're struggling with some leadership on. Ripple can stack these teams, over 3,000 vetted solopreneurs in various disciplines, WRIPPLE.com. Give them a shout, check them out. Dixie or Ray might actually be in the chat thread today, so feel free to ask them any questions. Mark, let's get going, man. Let's introduce our guest. Let's uh, figure out where we're headed in the future here. Yeah, how will AI, AI impact geoengineering, smart cities, the next generation of digital natives, blockchain, the internet of things? Um, we're going to find out. Our guest is Alexandra Whittington. She is a futurist, writer, speaker. She's a member of the Future of Business team at TCS, a former lecturer on Foresight at the University of Houston, which sounds fascinating. Um, she's co-authored several books on the future, including A Very Human Future, Aftershocks and Opportunities, and the Future Reinvented, I like that title. Um, and she's been featured as one of the world's top women futurists by Forbes. So, you know, we're very, very uh, privileged to have her. Welcome to the show, Alexandra. Thank you so much, Mark and Jeremy, great to join you. Yes, absolutely. So tell us, tell us, um, tell us what inspired you to start thinking about the future and what inspired you to kind of connect the dots in a way in a framework to help other people figure out what's going on in the future? Great question. And as you can imagine, I get asked this question a lot, right? I walk up to someone that I just met and we start chatting and I'm like, oh, I'm a futurist. Well, I got to explain that comment frequently. Um, so I became interested in becoming a futurist as an undergraduate student. I was in college and I came across a anthropology course that was called the study of the future. So I took that class. It was a very nice compliment to my anthropology studies because I'm someone who's just always been interested in people, like what is society all about? Where are we going as a society? Um, interested in history. And I found that futurism, as it's sometimes called, or as I actually like to call it, futurology, uh, is a, a great mix of all those things. You're talking about technology and people and culture and society and you know just every aspect of, of life can be um, addressed under the umbrella of futurism. 
I like that futurology. Uh, since we're sharing, sorry, Joe, I don't actually know why you started thinking about the future. Is there any correlation between yours and Alexandra's story? What, what's your? What's why I started? Story? Why I started thinking about the future? It's yeah. It's a. It's an intersection to me between you know humanity and the and the technology and processes that allow us to increase our capabilities and experience over time. That was really interesting. And like Alexandra, like you said, you have to look backwards to look forwards as well, right? So you have to understand the the beats in the story of humanity and then how technology over time and technology, the early technology was a letter, right? Letters made words, words made sentences. That was a very early technology. So um, I'm just fascinated in how tech can be applied in the right way to balance humanity. And you talk about the human side of, of the future in tech as well. How how can people create a balance between humanity and technology? Well, I think that's something that feels very um, relevant today, right? Because life is so technologically dependent, right? Everything we do is connected to the internet or somehow, you know, on Wi-Fi. Everything is smart around us, right? We live in this world that's very saturated in technology. So to me, when I think about, you know, retaining humanity or protecting humanity in that, it just means not losing sight of those things that cannot be uh, replaced with a man-made substitute. And by that, I mean uh, a lot of things that fall under the term um, emotional intelligence, right? Relational skills, things that most likely will always be um, in the human domain. So things that technology can't replicate or things that um, you know, you know, sort of retaining those things. I mean, to me, it's just simple stuff uh, like handwriting. I mean, I'm kind of fascinated by this idea that handwriting could go extinct. So few people these days use handwriting. You know, we, we're always typing, we're always on our phone. So while we have a very literary society, I mean, you were mentioning, you know, the first technology was a letter from an alphabet. Um, or not the first, but an early technology, you know, we still have that, but it's just so different. So, so there's some, some uh, twinge of humanity in there that we need to kind of look out for. We're a big fan of my, just my handwriting. So we take notes for book club and we actually force ourselves to use a pen and write them down on a, on a piece of paper. And honestly, I've got to say uh, it's taken about three months, but I can actually read what I've written now. <laughs> Hand, Alexandra wanted to, to accentuate a point that you mentioned, you know, handwriting is really powerful because it activates our brain in a way that, that typing does not. And if we're on a device, our potential for being distracted away from our thoughts and what we're thinking about and what we want to write, um, you don't have that distraction with a piece of paper and, and a pencil. So hopefully, hopefully that doesn't completely go away. But I do see like, I do see a lot of folks, you know, not even relying on pencils and paper anymore. Kind of scary. I think it would definitely be a departure from the majority of, uh, you know, pretty recent human history, right? So uh, that's the kind of thing I mean when I talk about I'm interested in humanity. Absolutely. So you so you got inspired from a from a course, uh, an undergrad course, which I think is man, what a great title for a course. And you kind of came full circle to now teaching, or you had taught in the past. Is it the same university where you did your undergrad? You know, it's so funny. It is. Absolutely. So um, some, I don't know, 10 or 15 years later, after completing a master's degree in the studies of the future, which is through, also through the University of Houston, um, I came back to teach that very same course that I took as an undergraduate uh, one semester. And then I became um, hired on with the Foresight faculty um, at the University of Houston and started teaching undergraduate courses there. So we have um, a master's in foresight at, in Houston, um, but there's no undergraduate degree or anything. So the courses that I taught were to students. It, it was really just so much fun because it was students who sort of saw that class and thought, oh, that sounds really interesting. It's not part of my major, but I just sort of want to see what it's all about. So I had people from the history department, from the languages, from, you know, every, you know, engineering technology. Uh, so it was a great opportunity to you know, kind of share the ideas of foresight about the history of the foresight movement and, and you know, reach students in a variety of fields of study. So, um, yes, it's a real, really cool story for me uh, that I got to come back and teach that course. And I stayed teaching for another 12 years. I actually uh, decided to go full time into the corporate world and sort of move into my next chapter. But I do hope to get back to teaching one day. People love to learn foresight. But that's it's so vital as well and so important, actually quite 
not a surprise, but maybe it is a surprise to some that people come from history and science and theology and anthropology, all these different subjects, because it, it touches everything. Like there, there is, it doesn't matter there's not technology. It touches every aspect of our lives and every aspect of education. How, just on the, on the, the teaching coming full circle and kind of teaching what you were taught, how is that class is the teaching methods changed at all is that is it vastly different to how you learn is there a different angle a different perspective i assume ai has taken on a lot more importance than it did when you did it but yeah could you expand on that yeah that's a great question um you know when i took my first future studies class in the 90s it was quite different from you know some yeah, 15 exactly. 20 years later yeah a lot had happened since then <laughs> so um I mean, I think the what hasn't changed is the kind of theory of the future, I guess you would say, right? The basic principles that, you know, futurism as a field of academic study goes back to the 1960s. I mean, you can, and, and foresight and futurism, future studies, whatever you call it, uh, really started growing after kind of the World War II period, right? That sort of post-war period is when it became really big in the U.S., and, and around the world. So um, it's been gradually seeping more into the universities around the states. And I would say more so um, probably in Europe and Asia, even Australia, uh, they have some strong uh, futurist presence of courses in their universities. Uh, but back then it was, you know, it was a, a once in a lifetime type of course. Um, so we still look towards the same thinkers, the same sort of theories, the same sort of uh, principles that, you know, there's an objective reality, the idea, the, the most core tenet, I would say, to the to the study of the future is that there's not just one future. So that hasn't changed. I learned that as a student futurist, and I taught that as a futurist professor. So there's, that's probably the biggest, um, you know, theoretical foundation that we have is this idea that we really limit ourselves by trying to predict a singular uh, future we really um, contribute what we contribute by talking about, well, there's multiple possibilities, there's different paths to the future, and we can be, you know, decisive, we can be, um, you know, mindful, and we can be thoughtful when we make our decisions. I love that. Uh, yeah. Quick, uh, quick plus up for all the quantum mechanical nerds like me out there that their futurism or futurology kind of lies in the many world interpretation uh, of small things. Uh, that's amazing. So let's talk about Are you saying the future is all of, in all of the things and do we, you know, the one that we arrive at. It's all it's all wave function collapse, Mark. Yep, I know, we're waiting, yep. we're waiting on it. And then we decide what it is. Um, so let's let's talk about let's. So the idea of foresight is super, super compelling and interesting. I don't think a lot of people know what what that is and what frameworks and foundations like general philosophy of foresight, like what is that and how do you teach it and how can it help someone that owns a business start thinking and pointing in the future direction? It's a terrific question. Um, I mean, at the first thing that we like to talk about, like I said, is that whole concept is kind of mind blowing. You know, when people come in and they're like, yeah, I'm interested in this future. What's this all about? Future studies. Well, first of all, there's not one future. And second of all, we don't predict the future. I think that always throws people uh, for a loop when you you know meet a futurist and they're like, yeah, I'm, I don't really make predictions. And actually, I don't really have a problem with predictions. What I have a problem with is trying to make accurate predictions. So I, I think predictions are actually really interesting and fun and they can be very provocative. Predictions can accomplish your goal, which is to start a conversation, right? We want to open up this conversation about the idea that let's say I predict this future, X, Y, Z. The conversation that matters around that is what happens next? What does that mean for my community, for my company, for my, you know, my personal future of what I want to do with my life? So how does it affect other things? What are the unintended uh, consequences or byproducts of those things? And then, um, you know, what can we do to avoid the negative aspects? In other words, how do we uh, influence the future. So I think for you know business owner or anyone who wants to embrace the foresight or futurist outlook, it's all about, um, it's really a research activity. It's really about studying trends, studying changes around you, being attuned to new ideas, to breakthrough technologies, to social movements, and putting those pieces 
into, you know, connecting them and putting them into motion and being able to play out these different thought experiments where you're like, okay, X, Y, Z happens, then what do we do? How will we respond? So there's sort of a, you know, strategic and, um, I guess, anticipatory element to it. It's, it's kind of, you know, preparing you for any possible outcome. It's a, it's a wonderful breakdown. And, you know, another nod to, to this book we read uh, in the book club called uh, Nexus, the Nexus, and um, talks about art, uh, technology, and science as this trifecta that has to work in coordination and largely uh, coordinated by design, which is like super interesting, right? So science, we make, scientists make predictions all the time. They just call them hypotheses, right? So what if we, what if we took away the scary language of predictions? Because if you make a prediction and you're wrong, you're thought of as not knowing what you're doing, right? But what if we call it an exploration? What if we call it a hypothesis, right? Is that a, is that a healthy way to look at it? Just Absolutely. Because well, with a prediction, of course, if you if you predict something, you're locked in. You you, you can't you don't have m room to maneuver because you've set this prediction. OK, we're heading for that prediction. You're subconsciously see it sitting in for the ride to that predicted future. And if you just have one, then I, I, it's, it's doomed to failure most of the time, isn't it? It certainly can be. Um, and if your goal is to be right, it's a it's a slippery path. But um, yes, I prefer hypothesis because hypothesis, as we all learned, you know, as young school kids, a hypothesis is an educated guess. And our guesses as futurists are very educated because, like I said, we do a lot of research. We don't just pluck things out of the air. We're not writing science fiction. Every scenario that we present is based on research. It's based on facts, it's based on data, it's based on evidence, and they can be substantiated through valid external uh, reliable sources. Uh, so we we do use research and, you know, data inputs to inform our scenarios. But there's that little bit of creativity that goes into it, because you have to think creatively with these data points, you can't just put them on the same trajectory that we've always used and said, it's just going to keep going in the same fashion, because we know that doesn't always happen, right? Sometimes things keep going in a certain direction, but they don't always necessarily. And unexpected things, things that we can call perhaps like these disruptions can, can be in our way. So we consider not only the research that we find, we take into account some degree of creativity um, and it involves, and that, that comprises an educated guess because a science fiction writer has the leeway, as you probably are aware as authors, you know, you can just write whatever you want. You can say, yeah, this is the, this is a future. This is a society that might exist, but there's, there's no evidence that any of that might happen. Now, a lot of times science fiction writers are, you know, very plugged into technology development and they're talking about stuff that's kind of on the horizon. But as a futurist, our thing is to go in with a, you know, evidence-based hypothesis. And like you said, have some some wiggle room there to say, this could happen, but what else could happen instead? And that's where people really start getting interested and engaged when you can present them your hypothesis and they can, you know, bounce back their own ideas. Jeremy's got some really good questions, but I'm just going to hijack his thought experiment just for one self-indulgent question for me. I, um, if I, so... You, you, you speak a lot of, some about geoengineering. I don't have much experience of geoengineering. If next week I had to write an article about the impact of AI and geoengineering or geoengineering on culture, how would I go about researching that as you would go about researching that? I, I, I probably don't have as much time, but maybe I've got a week to research. How would I, where would I begin and how would I go about that process? Yeah, that's that's a lot of what we do, you know, and I think that's the best part of being a futurist is I, I'll be asked, you know, tomorrow, can you do something about the future of pets? And I'm like, oh, my gosh, OK, I get to learn all about pets now. Right. You got to get to that baseline level before you can even talk about the future. So uh, to me, that's one of the funnest parts of the job is just getting to learn about so many different things at the drop of a hat. And, um, you know, for me, it's a lot of desk research. Um, if you have a week, you know, you're going to be depending on search engines. A lot of people are using uh, like the LLMs, the chat GPTs and whatnot to get some information. Uh, and I think we're going, you know, that hybrid uh, direction is definitely, you know, taking off when it comes to all sorts of research, including foresight. But yeah, it's a lot of looking for the latest. And this is what I always would tell my students when I would, you know, when they would be researching a topic, information that is, you know, within six months to a year 
right? If you find something really cool from 2014, that's great, but find something more recent, right? Just double check and make sure it hasn't, you know, advanced a little since then could happen. But, you know, we want current information. We want recent data. We want the very latest. So you would be Googling. I always use Google search under the news option. You know, you can search web or news or images. I pick news and then i tighten my time frame down to six months or a year. And I just do a variety of keyword searches, future of geoengineering, uh, geoengineering 2025, uh, geoengineering trends, geoengineering breakthroughs. And personally, I love research. I mean, I have, I'm not at all intimidated by, you know, a hundred pages of Google results. I just love nothing more than scrolling through those, picking out the good ones, storing them in some document or some spreadsheet or some online tool. I happen to use Google Collections a lot. I promise I'm not doing a Google commercial here. But I just use their tools a lot. But Google Collections is one way of holding your links. Um, and I, you know, in a week long project, I would just be eat, eating, sleeping, and breathing that topic to make myself enough of an expert so that I could understand not just the current state, but the possible future states and what are the external as well as the internal trends that are impacting where that topic could go in the future. Amazing. Thank you. That is really cool. What a tangible way to, to, to jump into today. If you needed to research something, that is a, that seems like a great place to start. So if we talk about like the deep dive research, when you get pointed in a direction by a, by, a, by a client and you go, you know, get that baseline information, just like you're talking about, I'm assuming also you have some sort of map or mechanic of like, just what, what you're watching uh, these macro trends in the world uh, related to people, related to population, related to technology that you're always kind of keeping tabs on? What are what are some of those? And they don't have to be like, oh, I go to this particular outlet, but just like, what are the buckets? What would you call those buckets and why are they important to connect them to specific research? Yeah, that's terrific. Um, there's a number of terms for that. Uh, I think you use the term uh, macro trends just now. A lot of people call them meta trends, mega trends. You can call them super trends. I mean, they're the big trends, right? Those are the very well established trends that have been around since I was, you know, in grad school in the 90s. Those are some of the things that haven't changed, not too much. I mean, they've evolved, but they're still important. And those are things like climate, things like uh, demographic changes, all sorts of demographic changes, whether it's, you know, low replacement rates or overpopulation, that, uh, that is one topic that sort of fluctuated. And I think it's kind of surprised people. And that's where we get at this idea of uncertainties, because even though there are these big mega trends, urbanization, um, you know, electrification, uh, clean energy, these things that are affecting you, no matter where you live, what your industry, what language you speak, if you're in, you know, in the world right now, this, this is going to have an effect on you. Those are really important to always, like you said, always kind of have those in the back of your mind. They're, they're always there. They're touching everything. But within that, there are smaller or perhaps less noticeable, perhaps less volatile uh, data points that we really need to think about. You might call them trends. You might call them issues. Some people refer to weak signals. Uh, there's also this idea of, um, you know, this sort of... Um, underground, you know, cultural ideas that are just bubbling up that you don't really hear about until they start um, spreading more through society, right? New ideas, new technologies, things that are kind of on the on the edge. So we're looking for both. We want a balance of both. We need to acknowledge those mega trends. Those are everywhere. They're, they mean a lot to every topic, you know, future of anything you're, you're studying. But those smaller trends will often give us um, pointers towards the alternative futures that I mentioned. So those will be super helpful in helping us, uh, in allowing us to pinpoint where could the expected future sort of take a turn, you know, sort of veer off in another direction or take us by surprise. Right. So that's the mix of those two is going to help us strike that balance so that we can have really good informed hypo hypotheses about the future. Speaking of hypotheses, one one we've had on the show quite a bit is this this um, kind of oscillation between uh, hierarchical systems and emergent systems that, you know, kind of power kind of really how the world and communities and businesses work. Would you say that like these macro trends are almost these like top down hierarchical inputs and then these micro trends, these cultural inputs are kind of this little emergent phenomenon that, that meets in the middle? 
Yeah, I think if you had to visualize it, that would be one way of doing it. They could meet in the middle, but uh, you know, they don't move at the same pace or the same rate. In uh, Future of Business at TCS, uh, we use this great concept that, um, you know, Frank Diana, who's our top futurist, he came up with this idea called convergence. So it's not necessarily about the trends themselves, it's about their convergence. All that is rising must converge, right? So if you have AI rising and you've got, uh, you know, clean energy rising, what happens when those two cross paths? That's what we're really interested in. I love that. I'm picturing like these, yeah, I mean, yeah. I'm picturing like these little uh, connection points that eventually become epicenters of exploration, right? Where all these things connect in, in strange ways. Um, you have like some, I think, I believe, like black swans that can come in. And I mean, to talk on that, the hierarchical macro, some of them, I mean, it, it do, I, I just feel that the climate stands apart from a lot of the other macro trends just because it's so disconnected from everything else like it's not really it's beyond our control if that makes sense it's external to the others yeah you know some of these are easier to influence than others uh but something that we were you know thinking about talking about today geoengineering is a perfect example of how we try to exert control over something like climate uh geoengineering is these sort of uh, high tech approaches to fixing climate. And it ranges from everything from blocking out the sun with a giant curtain that was making a lot of headlines a couple of weeks ago uh, to crushing up rocks, some certain kind of rocks and spreading them on farmlands, which has the dual purpose of absorbing carbon from the atmosphere and it also replenishes the soil with some minerals that, that it desperately needs. So uh, these I, the idea that we can kind of tweak the planet back into shape geoengineering is is one of the innovative um, concepts that to me it presents an uncertainty because first of all we don't know how well these things work we're not sure it's necessarily a good idea they would be very experimental uh, steps uh, but we're almost to a point where we don't have much other choice right we've got to do something desperate times call for desperate <laughs> measures That's have have you um have you read a book called the high frontier I haven't one of the most fascinating reads I've 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 came across in a long time. So it was written back in the '70s, and it was uh, done by this uh, scientist engineer in collaboration with NASA, and basically figured out a way to create civilizations in upper Earth atmosphere. And the plans were done, the budgets were done, everything is like, yeah, all the scientists were like, yeah, that's gonna work, that that could work. And part of that solution was harnessing solar power and transmitting it wire wirelessly back to the Earth, and written in the set there's so many there's so many things that were uh so many things were tried and attempted but just weren't given the the credence i guess or what the 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 whatever they deserved as a valid solution right so it's really interesting they, that they a lot taken of taken seriously yeah yeah um that wasn't yeah, a question like, that was like more it. just a general observation but hey i i think you'd really enjoy the high frontier really good book um Let's talk about uncertainty. Let's talk about navigating uncertainty because that's largely what, you know, not largely, but part of what you what you do, you, you get asked by by people to come in and say, hey, where where are we going? What's happening? What's going on? How do you navigate? How do you help people navigate uncertainty it, specifically from the human side? Because if you don't know the answer, that puts you not you, but if the person, if the business owner doesn't know the answer there's a bit of i don't know if it's ego management or whatever it is like if you don't know the answer you're not necessarily always open to new solutions right so how do you how do you help them think bigger and release um some of their old thought patterns to move forward because i think that's a big thing for future thinking right definitely and i think you know for me i have a lot of I try to use a lot of empathy and compassion when it comes to helping our clients with uncertainty because uncertainty is not fun. I mean, anytime you're in a position as a, you know, just as a person in your life where you don't know what's going to happen next, right? Is a natural disaster, you know, your power's out or something, or, you know, you're at work and the elevator breaks down. I don't know. When things get 
unpredictable. It makes people uncomfortable. And I think there's nothing wrong with that. You know, it's, it's actually, you know, if you have a life where things are constantly unpredictable and you never know what's going to happen next, you're probably in a state of like chronic PTSD. So I think that we need to acknowledge, first of all, the discomfort, the um, discord, disorientation um, that uncertainty causes. I mean, it's not, there's no shame in saying, yeah, this is confusing and I don't know what's going to happen next. And it's kind of stressful and unpleasant. You know, and I think that is not really addressed. You know, we just act like, well, the world's uncertain, just deal with it. You know, we need resilience. Everyone needs to be able to bounce back from whatever might happen. And actually, I think foresight is a great remedy to that concept because we shouldn't have to be fortified to the point where, you know, nothing can take you down. I mean, that's really asking a lot. Um, instead, why don't we make life a little bit more um, serene, right? And have a little bit of a sense of agency over what's happening. Say, yeah, it's it's uncertain, it's yeah, unpredictable, but I have a mindset that lets me deal with that. Uh, and the mindset could involve kind of, first of all, figuring out what do I exert control over and what don't I, what can I control? What can I Right? what that it's almost like a 12 step program. <laughs> I sound like when I'm saying that, No, like, this, is, <laughs> this is so spot on. In my opinion, it's a, a lot of the work that I do uh, with right to know you and some of the other things I do. Empathy is a key driver and you got to start there. And, and if you set the tone with empathy, then you kind of pull people away from this convergent mindset, right? Cause you mentioned mindset with it, which I think is, so spot on because we're we're taught to do things very linearly right from first second third grade all the way through college we do this thing we get this thing right if we we have to we have to be okay uh with being a little bit silly in a way right because divergent thinking thinking big and connecting dots requires a great mindset so you starting it with empathy is amazing i love that yeah um Jeremy, I'm looking forward to this. I believe you've got a thought experiment for us. Yeah. So, Alexandra, I'm going to give you full full rights uh, to say no to this. This is no is a perfectly acceptable answer yeah. to this question. Um, this is one of the points that I wasn't able to go go over in the in the pre pro. But um, what I thought it would be fun to do if Mark and I were a business we're business owners, right? And I can give you context to our business. How would you start the conversation to get us thinking? about the future. So let's say, let's say Mark and I, we have an installation company. Okay. We install technology in new homes, whether it's, you know, audio visual thermostat, you know, whole house, smart home kind of stuff, but we're really kind of setting our ways. We've got a process. We put this kind of tech in for all the homes it's scaled, but now our customers are starting to like ask us different things. Like what should we be thinking about? for the next version of what people might expect in a home. And you can say we can move to another topic, all up to you. No, actually I am very into the topic of the future of the home, so I'm glad you asked. Um, you know, what I would say is, uh, you know, assume I'm not trying to teach you how to think more like a futurist. I'm just gonna share some of my kind of ideas of my own. Um, I would say, start to consider the idea that the home could be literally kind of uh, connected to the, the brain. There's this technology known as brain computer interface. Neuralink from Elon Musk is a very popular example that, that people are familiar with. And so what if you, your home and your mind were, were connected and you could actually, when you're in your home, almost use telepathy to say, turn on the lights, run the washing machine, open the door. What if you could communicate with other people in the home through some sort of brain computer interface? What if anytime you got into your bed or on a certain chair or something, you were engaged in some sort of um, either productivity enhancing or relaxing or some sort of other um, brain stimulation, brainwave stimulation that helped your life feel more comfortable, right? It helped you feel better. Perhaps it could bring you uh, mental peace or wellness. So I would say, you know, if you've sort of plateaued on the basic smart home uh, product installation, I would say, take the next step and look at what happens when the human mind becomes the interface for the house. Well, my, my business partner, Mark, who you've met, uh, is really, you know, locked into, he's still pulling cat five cable into these houses just because he's negotiated great price rates with, with all of these folks. He doesn't think we need to even put wireless in, you know, how I'm having trouble convincing him to to look forward. What can I do to open up? Our his... business is on the ropes, Alexandra. As you can hear, you know it's uh, it's now or never. It's make or break. 
Yeah. Yeah. Thank you guys. Yeah. You got some serious issues there, but uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. No, that, you know. the, so the, so the catalyst, so the, yeah. So that was an interesting, um, the, the idea of like, you know, Neuralink, Neuralace or whatever, I think is in, in, you know, fMRI machines have been studying brain waves and their connectivity into all these other things. It, that's a really interesting thing to think about. Where, what do you think the main, what do you think the main blocker to uh, adoption of, of that kind of thing can be? And we're not talking about tomorrow. I mean, let's, this is like 15 years from now where we're all running around doing Buckminster Fuller telepathy out of our brains and all of that. But what's the blocker to that? Do you think that people are going to need to need to think about as users? Uh, well, of course, there's uh, this whole issue of someone potentially hacking your brain or, you know, taking, I mean, there's just that little, oh, little issue, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, turning into a human robot or something. I'm not sure. But, um, you know, I think that there is, there's huge obstacles to overcome because we have to trust whoever it is. I mean, am I going to trust you guys to put something in my brain? I don't think so. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but well, we you take know that like that that word trust that you said there and we were talking about trust just before we came on and how important it is for brands and people to trust the technology we were talking about ai at the time but in fact this question although it, it seems quite absurd to talk about the, the neuralink aspect of it but the same question applies to all technology like how do we learn or how do we trust mm -hmm. this technology and not just neuralink but a ai and well, if you run a geoengineering plan, how do you trust what they're doing? It kind of, it, I think it applies across the board. Absolutely. And the digital world has added another layer to that trust because previously trust was all about, oh, I see you, I know you, you live in my community, I know your parents. That is gone, right? We live in a very distributed society. Uh, so, you know, th there's we need to figure out what is trust? How, how do we... Uh, get the advantages we want to get from this without having to give up too much privacy or too much freedom or whatever it might be. Distributed trust is really an interesting concept to think about. Like, and that goes probably, so we had this, we had this as a, a potential discussion topic is like the digital identity piece of things. And how does digital identity creation and management lead to the development of distributed trust? Yeah, I mean, digital identity is a really interesting topic that gets linked in with things like blockchain, IoT, okay, there's all the yeah, all these other uh, rely reliance technologies that are inter reliant, interrelated. Um, but I think you know the idea of digital tech uh, identity is that like I can walk into the post office or the store and everything's all smooth. I don't have to take a credit card out of my purse. I don't have to, you know, it just it should make life totally frictionless. And while that might sound cool. I mean, what you're basically in a surveillance society, right? I mean, are you okay with being constantly watched and constantly monitored? And at the same time, if you fall and break your hip, you know, they're going to know, you know, someone's going to come and save you. And so there's, there's a trade off there. Um, and, and I think digital identity is, you know, one more step closer to making that decision as a society and saying, is this how we want to do it? Um, what are the costs and, and what are the benefits? It's, it goes back to, we've talked about this on the show a bunch too, is the, um, the convenience versus security yeah. seesaw, right? You know, I always use the Waze example. When I, when I go for a drive, I put an address in, super convenient, picks traffic routes, but it also knows where I go at 245 every Wednesday, right? But that trade-off is, is okay for me because the, the reward I get now is, is, I don't know, come see me in 20 years when Waze is you know, created a digital version of me doing weird things, but I don't know. Uh, do you consider security convenience equations at all when you think about some of these bigger trends? For sure. I think those are two really important variables when it comes to evaluating, you know, the future of any technology. You can really plug that into your scenarios, the scenario being where you take one driving force, AI, and another major driving force like climate change, and then you introduce this um, kind of... Uh, I guess you call it a continuum on one end is security on one end is um, privacy. Right. And you can go through and look at, you know, the different, the different scenarios, literally what happens when these intersect, when you have a high level of uh, security and a lot of AI, uh, what kind of society is that? How do you do business? How do you, how do you live? Um, so that, that would definitely be a big consideration. Yeah. Love it. But so if also, we could I just say, I just love how, when you're talking, you, you're asking questions it's almost like you're 
and that's one of the most important parts of thinking about the future is asking questions and you're always asking questions so that's really great to see so and, and a good lesson that we can learn uh, aware of time jeremy should we move on to our our last question for alexandra yes please fire away alexandra so what we're going to start this new thing where our current guests leaves a question for our next guest we want to we've always like the, the whole thinking on paper is about the impact of this technology on the human condition and having a this through thread that runs through all our episodes and our book clubs so with that in mind, could we ask you to leave us a question that we will ask for our next guest? It doesn't. You don't need to know what who our next guest is or what their domain is. That's not important. It's just this thread of a tech on the human condition. Rooted, rooted in your genuine curiosity, like a question that's been wrapping your brain for the last, I don't know, a couple of months. Uh, you know, I'm going to go with uh, inspiration from a quote. Um, will AI be the best thing or the worst thing that happens to humanity? It's a great question. That is a big one. It's that a is big a big one. one. It's a biggie. Um, um, thank you. Yeah, that's a great one, Alexandra. Thanks so much. What about what about any book recommendations you might have for people? Good in, good inputs equal good outputs. What are you what are you uh, what are you reading this day these days that are that's exciting you? Uh, well, I'm rereading an old book, also from the 90s, uh, kind of like me. It's called uh, Guns, Germs, and Steel by Jared Diamond. Remember that one? I don't know if you guys are He was a geographer, no, I, I think, I like by training. Title. Yeah, it's a really cool book. I, I remember reading it way back then. I actually went to his like book signing or something for one of his books back then. And I still have it. And I was like, I'm going to reread this. It's quite interesting. It's kind of about you know all of human history. It's one of those big thick books that explains what explains is how guns, germs, and steel help certain societies, you know, overpower others. Uh, so it's a really cool book. Uh, but I also, I mean, I can't help but recommend, I just happened to have one of my <laughs> recent books that I uh, co-edited, Aftershocks and Opportunities too. This is part of the book series we did with as multiple uh, contributors. It's a great book of different perspectives about the post-pandemic society. So I, mm. I definitely recommend that one. We'll, we'll put all those in the show notes so everybody can have links to to get those. Thank you. Amazing. Wonderful. Alexandra, this was a great chat. I, I, I love how you think about these things. I love the frameworks yeah. that you have in place to, to help people navigate it. I love that you lead with empathy because a lot of people don't, a lot of people, when they're talking about technology and future, it's all about tech, 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 and what these systems can do and how they can scale and big, big, big. But it's like, hey, we're still humans. We have to, we have to understand and appreciate each other. Right. So I think that's, that's fascinating. Uh, listeners, we are going to be posting. Mark does a great write up after every episode with uh, links and how you can find Alexandra and more about her work and, and what she's doing. Um, so have a look at on that. We want to thank ripple again, W R I P P L E.com marketing's on demand talent platform. These guys can stack teams for you guys. You got a project, you got a program, that uh, you need to flex out with some uh, outsourced experts. These guys are great. Dealing with them is amazing. They have 3,000 vetted solopreneurs. P.S. Mark and I are in that pool, if you so desire. Um, but they're great. Check them out, W-R-I-P-P-L-E. We're grateful for their support of our show. And Book Club, Mark, remind them what's going on. Book Club, we're reading Clear Thinking by Shane Parrish, an indispensable guide to making smarter decisions each day. And that's from James Clear, author of Atomic Habits, and everyone knows who he is. So check it out every Tuesday on YouTube. And yeah, if you're still here, please like, subscribe, share, because we need more people thinking on paper. And also thinking on paper.xyz is where you can find us. Yeah. Be curious, stay disruptive. Keep thinking on paper. Bye-bye.